understanding of pathophysiology of DHT is fundamental and since the whole process of sexual development is so complex, one needs to understand the real nuances before even planning as far as assessment and management is concerned. It is definitely really, really fascinating to understand how something of uh, a few cells can really evolve into an entirely dimorphic picture of uh, the sexual development of boys and girls. It is really remarkable to remember that all the organs, starting from the gonads, the steroidogenic cells, the internal genitalia and external genitalia are all essentially derived from bipotential structure. So this whole process of sexual development takes place in a systematic manner which in rare situations does go awry. So the process of sexual development really starts with the development of the genetic sex followed by development of gonad as per the genetic sex, development of hormones produced by the gonads, action of those hormones on receptors and finally resulting in development of the internal and external genitalia and the formalization of gender identity of that individual. So in a girl, this will be an XX carrier type leading to the development of ovaries following the production of estrogen acting on the estrogen receptor causing sustenance of mullerian structure and development of a female gender of identity. It has been a convention to really describe female gender development or sexual development as a passive or a default mode. This is not entirely true because now we really know a number of genes which are specifically involved in the development of the ovaries. Having said that, the abnormalities in many of these genes and other disorders of steatogenesis typically will not present with atypical genitalia because the overall development of the internal cell structures will be normal but they will usually present with primary amenorrhea, delayed puberty or even secondary amenorrhea in certain situations. So for a XX individual to really have an atypical genitalia, there would need to be something which is active. It's not just acts of omission, but it has to be act of commission in the form of androgen excess, which typically comes from the adrenals and rarely from the placenta or the mother. In boys, the XY karyotype results in development of the testis, which then produces testosterone, dihydrotestosterone and anti hormone, which respectively acts on the Wolfian duct, external genitalia and the Mullerian duct using the allergen receptor and the AMH receptor type 2 to lead to persistence of Wolfian structure and development of male. In the whole male pathway, the major causes of disorder sexual differentiation are essentially acts of omission. In the sense, either the genes which are responsible for testicular development are not there or because of excessive ovarian genes, the testes do not develop. The steroids are not being formed by gonads which have been developed or these steroids are not activated or acting. So in a nutshell, female disorder of sexual differentiation can be considered to be acts of commission in that we have androgen excess while male disorder of sexual differentiations are more of act of uh, omission in which the whole pathway is not developed. So based upon this template, we can think of uh, disorder of sexual differentiation into those which are associated with determination of the gender, development of gonads, production of hormones, their action, differentiation in form of internal as well as external structure, and finally, adaptation as far as the specific gender of identity. The most important and the first step as far as the whole uh, sexual development process is concerned is the development of the bipotential gonad from the coelomic epithelium of the urogenital ridge, which typically starts around 4 to 6 weeks of life. This is a very important part of the fetus and from there three important structures are formed, namely the adrenal under the effect of NR5A1 gene at around 6 to 7 weeks of gestation. Kidneys, which development really takes place in terms of the effects of WT1 gene. And finally, the gonads, in which both WT1 
and NR5A1 play an important role as far as development is concerned. Now, what is important to understand is that while NRF5A1 is important for both adrenal development as well as gonadal development as well as serogenesis in the Leydig cells, the amount of NR5A1 required for adrenal action is much lower compared to that required for the gonadal development. So contrary to the earlier belief that adrenal insufficiency would be an important part of most individuals who present with sort of sexual differentiation because of NR5A1, the whole spectrum has really expanded in that it usually presents with XY gonadal dysgenesis with adrenal involvement in certain individuals. The concerted action of WT1 and NR5A1 results in the development of a bipotential gonad and the binary switch or the most important step which results in determination of which side this gonad will go to whether as a testis or a ovary happens with the SRY or the sex related chromatin in the Y chromosome which is located in the pseudo-orthosomal region of Y chromosome, the short arm and this SRY gene is the major testis determining factor. SRY expression is increased by NR5A1 and both of these genes then act on a downstream pathway comprising of SOX9 which results in testicular growth as well as production of Sertoli cells and AMH which causes Mullerian regression. SOX9 is also important in the sense it is also involved in the skeletal development. So SOX9 deficiencies or abnormalities can present with a campomelic skeletal dysplasia. The ovarian development has long been considered to be a passive process. A process in which if SRY is not there, SOX9 will not increase and you have ovarian development. But now we know there are a number of ovarian genes which have really helped development of ovaries and FOXL2 is very important along with DAX1 and these two result in ovarian development. DAX1 is a very interesting gene because it is involved in multiple aspects of pediatric endocrine disorders. DAX1 is an ovarian development gene as well as an anti testis gene. So if there is duplication of DAX1, there would be a situation where testicular development will not happen and therefore it is an important cause of XY DST with complete reversal as far as sexual development is concerned. Deficiency of DAX1 in an x link manner is also an important cause of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and adrenohypoplasia congenita which is an important cause of adrenal insufficiency in boys. Now FOXL2 and FOX9 are always in a fight with each other and therefore they try to even out the development of the testis and ovary and it is the victor of these two which decides whether we have the testicular development or the ovarian development. Now once the gonads are formed, the next important aspect of the gonads are actually the germ cells. And these germ cells are produced by the hindgut at around 6 weeks of gestation. And from there, they tend to migrate across the different parts of the body based upon some chemotactic movements and other factors. When the germ cells, based upon WNT5A and SDF1, they migrate and reach the ovaries, under the retinoic acid effect and the gene STRA-A8, they undergo a meiosis. And following that meiosis, there is a meiotic arrest. And this is the point where around 10 to 11 weeks, the germ cells would have come into the ovaries and will really have a meiosis and stay there. They will then develop, along with the other structures which will be there, develop the oocytes and there will be a significant number of oocytes which would have developed by around the end of gestation and they will be the source of further development for each cycle subsequently. The germ cells which migrate to the testis do not have the retinoic acid environment star A8 and therefore they are actually having a mitotic arrest. They don't undergo the first meiosis at this point. Any other germ cell which is there is actually destroyed in the body 
but really we can have germ cells which may skip this destruction and they can then produce subsequent germ cell tumors typically in the mediastinum in liver and most commonly in the cns areas like germinomas and which can cause precocious puberty in boys Testicular development happens a bit earlier as far as ovarian development is concerned and as we already discussed that NR5A1, SRY and SOX9 genes are the major determinants of testicular development and herein we have a development of five different cell types in the testes of which Sertoli cells are the first one to develop under largely the effect of SOX9 which produce AMH which is anti-mullerian hormone which is responsible for inhibition or regression of mullerian structure as well as inhibin B. AMH and inhibin B are very important markers of Sertoli cell functions and they will remain high even in the prepubertal age. So if there is a doubt about the functional testicular tissue particularly in an individual who has bilateral cryptorchidism in which we are considering a possibility of either abdominal testes or anarchia, measurement of AMH and inhibin B levels will really help further management in that if the levels are really low, there is no further need of laparoscopy or evaluation to identify those gonads. The second cell line to develop is a Leydig cell which is largely under the control of NR5A1 which produces testosterone and insulin-like factor 3. And this insulin-like factor 3 is important in that it is responsible for the initial phase of testicular descent up to the inguinal canal. So if there is complete gonadal dysgenesis, these gonads will not even descend to the inguinal canal. But if we have problems predominantly in testosterone synthesis or action, the gonadal descent will happen till the gonad. So this can happen in 17 beta HSD deficiency. 5 alpha reductase deficiency or androgen insensitivity syndrome but from there on the gonads will not descend in the their normal position. There also will be development of germ cells which we discussed will be stopped at the level of mitosis and myoid cell and endothelial cells will develop. Ovarian development as we know now is also requiring number of genes like WNT4, FOXL2 and DAX1 and then it develops into the theca cell which produces endosterinidione and granulosa cell which under the aromatase will produce estrogen. Deficiency of this aromatase enzyme will result in increased level of androgens at birth causing virilization in the mother and fetus while subsequent estrogen deficiency will result in delayed puberty. They also will have oocytes which will be really stuck up at the level of meiosis and oocyte along with the granulosa cells will produce AMH which help in further development. Steroidogenic pathway is extremely important because all the hormones testosterone, dihydrotestosterone and estrogen are ultimately produced by this pathway. It's important to understand that a large chunk of this pathway is shared by the three organs, the testis, adrenals and the ovaries. So the whole pathway of development of DHEA under the influence of star, side chain cleavage, 3 beta HSD and CYP17 really is shared by all three organs. Subsequently, adrenals have the 21 hydroxyl and 11 hydroxyl which would produce the cortisol and mineralocorticoid respectively, while testis has the 17 beta HSD which under the influence of the common LHHCG receptor which is known as LHCG receptor causes testosterone production. Now this LHCG receptor is equally affinity as far as both HCG is concerned as well as LH is concerned. And in the first trimester of life it is the HCG which is responsible for stimulation of LHCG receptor and production of testosterone. After that period, it is the pituitary which starts producing LH and then controls the secretion as far as the uh, testosterone is concerned. Therefore, individuals who are completely hypogonadotropic hypogonadism like Kalaman syndrome who have no LH exposure, even they will have normal testosterone production in the first 12 weeks of life and therefore they will not develop 
obvious ambiguity and usual presentation will only be micropenis. Ovaries produce aromatase which then causes the production as far as the estrogen is concerned and this again is under the gonadotropin control. Aromatase deficiency as discussed results in fetal and maternal virilization at birth and delayed puberty polycystic ovarian appearance and large ovaries later on in life in girls. Once the testosterone is formed, it has a direct effect on the Wolfian structure because the concentration of testosterone in that region is very, very high. So even though testosterone has lower affinity compared to its activated form, which is dihydrotestosterone, which is formed by the influence of 5-alpha reductase 2 on androgen receptor, the high local concentration of testosterone causes the Wolfian duct development. But that is not sufficient to cause the external genitalia development, which happens under the effect of the dihydrotestosterone. So individuals who have dihydrotestosterone deficiency in the classical sense, the 5-alpha reductase deficiency, would not have external visualization. But when the testosterone levels increase during puberty, they will start acting on the androgen receptor and cause virilization. And that's why often individuals who have 5 alpha reductase deficiency undergo virilization during puberty. Similar virilization is also observed in individuals who have partial androgen insensitivity syndrome and those who have 17 beta HST3 deficiency because whatever limited amount of testosterone is there, it will start acting. On the contrary, those who have androgen insensitivity syndrome will not respond to this high level of testosterone and will not virilize while they will have a feminization because this testosterone will be peripherally aromatized. This has significant clinical implication in that individuals with 5-alpha reductase deficiency, partial androgen insensitivity and 17-beta-HST with some testosterone secretion may have a good potential of male gender of rearing, while those who have complete androgen insensitivity syndrome would definitely have a female preference as far as gender of rearing is concerned. Estrogen acts on the ER alpha and ER beta receptors to work on the bone, breast tissue and uterus. So having gone into the genetic and the hormonal level, let's go into more gross and in terms of the actual structures which are developed. So the male development starts off by seven weeks the production of the antimolinate hormone. And before that, there are common internal and external structures. So there will be the Mullerian duct, which is a precursor for the female organs, while Wolfian duct, which is a precursor for the male internal genitalia. So AMH produced by around six to seven weeks by Sertoli cells causes regression of Mullerian structure and testosterone produced by around eight weeks will cause sustenance of the Wolfian structure resulting in the development of the epididymis, vast difference and seminal vesicle. So therefore, if a gonad is present and the Mullerian structure is also present, it means that there is a problem of AMH production. Well, if the gonad is there and there is disorder of sexual differentiation, but there are no malignant structure, it means it's mostly either a steroidogenic defect or there is a problem as far as the action of androgens are concerned. Female development basically happens in the absence of AMH, the malignant structures will be there. And in the absence of testosterone, the Wolfian duct will regress and estrogen will sustain it, wherein the malignant structure will develop into the fallopian tube uterus and upper part of vagina. The external genitalia development is dependent upon the effect of dihydrotestosterone and in the presence of dihydrotestosterone, the genital tubercle develops into the penile structure and there is a labioscrotal fusion which happens from the posterior to the anterior. And the best way to assess this labioscrotal fusion is to actually look at the anogenital distance and a uh, lesser anogenital distance is indicative of lower amount of virilization or masculinization and maybe because of environmental exposure to 
the estrogenic compounds. Importantly, there is a 8 to 13 week window wherein maximum virilization can happen. So the potential for penile growth is determined by 12 to 13 weeks of life. Beyond that, there can only be some incremental growth, but the size cannot increase drastically. The second thing to remember is that this is the period wherein the labioscrotal fusion is completed. So if there is any abnormality happening after 12 weeks of life, there would only be decreased penile size, but no evidence of hypospadias. And this is classical as we discussed about the LHCG receptor defects. For females, in the absence of DHT and effect of estradiol, we have development of the clitoris, the labia minora and the labia majora. And similarly, after 12 weeks of life, there would be no labioscrotal fusion. So therefore, conditions causing postnatal virilization will only cause clitoromegaly and not labioscrotal fusion. Gender identity is a very complex situation and includes a combination of gender identity as to how an individual perceives them as in which gender, gender role which can actually be modified by the social influence and finally sexual orientation and now by and large it is considered that androgens play a very important role particularly into the 8 to 12 week period to really decide about the gender identity of an individual and therefore those who have a prenatal androgen exposure like virilizing CH there may be issues about whether the aromatic, whether the androgenization will cause a problem. This is particularly important for somebody like 5 alpha reductase deficiency because testosterone exposure to the brain will in a way virilize the pain and increase the likelihood of a male gender of identity. Now just to summarize the pathophysiology, we now know that urogenital rich results in development of the bipotential gonad along with adrenal under the influence of NRAF1, A51 gene and kidney under the influence of Wilms tumor 1 gene. So, this bipotential gonad under the effect of SRY and SOX9 produces testis, which Sertoli cells produces AMH, which acting on the AMH receptor 2 causes malaria regression, while Ladic cell producing testosterone under the influence of the LHCG receptor, using HCG in the first trimester and LH subsequently will produce testosterone, which is converted by 5 alpha reductase type 2 to dihydrotestosterone, which acts on the androgen receptor, causing genital growth. On the other hand side, we have the DAX1 and FOX cell 5, which results in ovarian development of theca cell producing androstenedione and granulosa cell producing aromatase, causing estrogen production, and therefore we will have estrogen receptor causing genital growth and Molarian Wolfian regression. You also have adrenals which are important source of androgen causing virilization in females. So in this background, we can have a problem of gonadal dysgenesis in the setting of NRA51 gene. Danish Drash and Frazier syndrome are classical associations of Wilm tumor 1 and they present with NIREDIA, Wilm's tumor, renal failure, nephrotic syndrome. SRY gene problems and SOX9 problem can also cause gonadal stenosis. Abnormality in LHCG receptor defects will really result in uh, severe cases as a female phenotype with palpable gonads, Ladic cell hypoplasia, high levels of LH and low levels of endostrian ion. Synthetic defects can really result in a number of problems including a combined adrenal testicular problem or a testicular problem alone. 5 alpha reductase deficiency will present with uh, significant problems at birth followed by some virilization during puberty. While androgen insensitivity syndrome in a complete form will typically present as a girl with primary amenorrhea, inguinal testis, sparse pubic hair and normal breast development. While partial forms can have a whole spectrum. AMH resistance will result in a problem of persistent Mullerian duct. Aromatase deficiency as discussed presents with fetal and maternal virilization in the neonatal period followed by delayed puberty subsequently. And finally, a number of forms of CAH like uh, 21 hydroxyl deficiency, 11 hydroxyl deficiency, 3 beta HSD deficiency will present with 
verilization in the setting of XXDHD. Just to summarize the steroidogenic pathway and its effect in sexual development, cholesterol is produced by the influence of 7 dehydroxycholesterol by DHC7, which is the straight limiting step as far as cholesterol synthesis is concerned. And from there, it is converted in testis to testosterone, estradiol in ovaries, and from adrenal, we have the production of mineralocorticoid, leucocorticoids, and DHEAs. The cholesterol is converted to DHEA, which seems to be a common metabolite throughout the whole pathway under the influence of number of genes, particularly star and side chain cleavage enzyme, which basically converts cholesterol into pregnenolone, followed by 3 beta HSD to progesterone and 17 hydroxyl, which really produces DHEA. From there, the adrenals has 11 and 21 hydroxyl, which produces mineralocorticoid and leucocorticoid respectively. The testes has 7 beta HSD, which causes production of testosterone and ovaries have a aromatase enzyme, which produce the estrogen. So in this setting, it is very easy to identify as to which steroidogenic defect will be associated with what problem. So if we have the smith lemeli optis syndrome, which is characteristically characterized by DHC7 problem, there will be a XY DHD with mild salt wasting. If there is a star or side chain cleavage enzyme, there will be decreased and as cortisol, mineralocorticoid, and androgen. So there will be decreased production of all hormones, typically presenting with XY DHT and salt wasting. 70 hydroxylase presents with XY DHT and hypertension, while 21 hydroxylase presents with DHT in a female fetus along with salt wasting, while 11 hydroxylase will have excess DHT with hypertension. 17 beta HSD problem is associated with isolated testicular testosterone production defect resulting in XY DHT, while aromatase deficiency will cause XX DHT as discussed.